uh, to summarize where we are after the three days uh, and then to try and consolidate um, what we've learned and uh, formulate by the end of this conversation a, uh, a sort of action plan, a, a, a roadmap going forward for where we can take all of this good, um, good conversation and, uh, and data. Uh, as Paul said, um, I'm Nick Cook. Um, I uh, was a journalist. I'm a consultant at the moment. I'm also a writer. So uh, a part of my job today is to take the narrative, as I've learned it and as I've seen it and as you've outlined it, and to sort of stitch it together in a way and uh, feed those elements of the narrative into a story going forward. And I think it's it's a very exciting story that I've heard here in the last three days. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's been brilliantly told chapter by chapter by, uh, by, by, by you lot. Um, so we're going to consolidate that now in the form of the panel uh, discussion. We've got a lot to get through and there are a lot of people on the panel. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce you all to the audience. And um, just to say to the audience that uh, I'm going to seek to get uh, at least one question to everyone in the hour and 20 minutes that we've got. But um, obviously, I want to, to, to flow the conversation and discussion in as natural a way as possible. So we'll seek to do that. So um, without further ado, my panel consists of uh, Paul Pereira, who is founder of Vassal, and my mask fit, and, and who obviously has been our moderator for the last couple of days. And uh, as uh, many of you know, Paul is uh, uh, ex Airbus, Rolls Royce, BAE Systems, and GK and Aerospace. So um, stellar credentials in, in uh, aviation and aerospace. Uh, we then have Jackie Castle, who is the UK engineer for A380 Airbus. We have Phil Smith, managing director of Business West. Claire Gibson, Head of Delivery, Heart of the Southwest, LEP. Ben Rhodes, Deputy Director, Southwest at the CBI. Simon Earls, Planning and Sustainability Director at Bristol Airport. Helen Isles, Senior Policy Advisor, West of England, Combined Authority, WECA. David Morgan, Director of Flight Operations and Lead on Future Flight Technology at EasyJet. Toby Savage, leader of South Gloucestershire Council and Deputy Mayor, Wecker. Simon Henley, Business and Industry Strategy Advisor at Reaction Engines. And Ben Harrop, Hydrogen Economy Lead at Department of Business Enterprise, Innovation and Skills, Bayes, whom we've um, recently heard. So, um, Paul, I want to come to you first. Uh, what have been your key takeaways from this summit and have any surprises been delivered in it? So I think very quickly, if we sat here a year ago, I would have been thought as a crazy person to be bringing up hydrogen going into aerospace um, and aviation. And I know that the smirk on David's face, but I've been working in the background on this for some years. And Simon knows when I was at Rolls-Royce, I was probably the, the lone wolf trying to push hydrogen into aviation. So I guess what I've heard is I'm not so crazy after all. Um, on that hand, I think there's still a lot of work to do and there's so many challenges that we need to um, solve. But if, if we look back in this year, and I think the one thing that I've learned is technology is there to help us. You know, Kim and I worked together through the Ventilator Challenges, PA Consulting, and Rolls-Royce was also there, Airbus as well, Jackie. Um, we learned that actually in collaboration and applying technology, we can solve almost anything. And I think from the spirit of the last three days has been really positive. You know, we're in the most dire times if we really want to look at aerospace in terms of where we're, we are this minute. But actually our long-term future, because of this collaboration, because of this change, and I call it change in the air, as I spoke about earlier in the week, I think it's really seriously impressive how we've been able to bring such great individuals and knowledge from all the companies together and see a different light. So I have a positive outlook on the next 10 years and forecast that we'll be flying hydrogen, every one of us, in, in that time frame. 
Well, I have to say, as a sort of semi-impartial observer in all of this, I, what I've really uh, enjoyed hearing is the fact that this is a, a forum that has brought together you know, many viewpoints, many sectors, and whilst it is focused on aviation, it is not exclusively about aviation. And that's what I think is such a power. It's, it's a very powerful message that. Um, before we turn to some of the other sector inputs into this, uh, into this narrative, I wanted to come to, to Jackie, Jackie Castle of Airbus. Um, Jackie, Airbus's uh, association with the region is, is long and well known. Um, how impressed are you by what you've heard here in the past few days? And what do you think that the UK supply chain uh, in aerospace to begin with must do in order to um, cement its future with Airbus, which is so critical in, in this hydrogen story for aviation going forward? Well, thank you. Um, well, I agree that I believe um, it's been really inspiring these last few days. Um, we've seen lots of synergies across all of the different uh, sectors of the industry. Um, and in a world that's been very difficult over the past year, especially for the aerospace industry, but for everybody, really, where everything seems to be put on hold. It's really it's really good to see how much work in how much uh, sort of um, stepping forward everybody is doing with regards to energy for the future and climate change. So I, I think it's really, really inspiring. Um, as I said, I can see synergies across the different, uh, regardless of the products that you're in. So if we talk about rail or other transportation means or aerospace or just energy in general. I mean, there's really um, a key uh, link between them all. And, and that is how we uh, develop the infrastructure to support those products. And, um, and I think there's lots that we can do to work together to look at, you know, the safety and certification and uh, infrastructure aspects of sort of taking hydrogen forward for the future. So uh, it's certainly given um, me a lot to think about, and I'm sure it's the same for all of the different industries. Um, to come to your second question around um, cementing um, uh, people's uh, sort of uh, inputs into this, this, this direction that we seem to be going in for the future. Um, of course, the, the established supply chain, if you like, uh, you know, Every industry needs to change to survive and needs to look forward and needs to see the direction of sort of growth of their industry. And I'm sure that the existing supply chain are understanding the sort of direction things are going in and looking at what that means for their current portfolio and what that means they need to develop in terms of skills or products for the future. Um, but I think there's also um, new, you know, if you're talking about an evolution potentially here in aerospace, it's not just a, an incremental change this time. And uh, it requires new skills and uh, potentially new entrants into um, this industry. And so um, perhaps one of the best ways that those sorts of people can get involved with the, with the bigger uh, organisations is through some of the research initiatives that are going on at the moment. Um, and a lot of things like the catapult that we've heard about earlier, and there are many uh, avenues through ATI as well to get funding into and to uh, bring their specialisms and their expertise in, into uh, into the direction that we're going. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps answer that question. That's our thoughts. It does. Thank you. Um, and before I let you go, Jackie, I just... Um wanted to, I had some, one supplemental. Um, this is obviously a regional story that we are here to, um, to talk about. But I wondered, given the enormous disruptions that we've seen over the past year in aviation, uh, not just in terms of the pandemic, but also with Brexit, of course, how fit do you think the region is and the country um, in Airbus's eyes to take this uh, uh, exciting clean energy future uh, forward? Okay, well, if I, if I turn just to the UK aspect first, then, um, Airbus understands that its UK workforce is a highly skilled workforce uh, and that we're in a key integrated part of Airbus as a company. So actually, I think whilst Brexit, of course, been a concern uh, for everybody, um, 
and a lot of uncertainty sort of around it for a, for a long time. Um, I think now that we, we know where we are with it, uh, we can move forward. And I, I don't see uh, a particular issue for Airbus as a company and the, and the inputs that the UK uh, brings into that. Um, turning more to the southwest, I mean, I think it's been a, a real eye opener to listen to all of the discussions that we've had in this summit. It's been really excellent. It just goes to show that we've got such a breadth of skill and, um, and knowledge and uh, resources, if you like, in the southwest that we really should be pushing forward um, with with plans for what this region can can take from the um, opportunities that present themselves. And I agree with Kim earlier that it's really climate change to some extent is an opportunity. Um, and we need to we need to take that and um, you know really go with the momentum that we see at the moment. I think the the other thing I was going to say is that um, I think it's more possible perhaps for regions to take a path of their own because of the, the way the energy can be generated in much more sort of local hubs. Um, so if, if the region can look at that and see what it needs and, uh, and what uh, uh, electricity generation is more suited to this area, um, then we, we should be able to find the best sort of efficient means to move forward. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity and hope for the future and we really need to grasp it and to move forward with this momentum that we've seen over the past few days. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to turn to Phil Smith of Business West next. Phil, obviously, um, as Jackie said, this is, uh, you know, we've been focusing on the, on the region, uh, and rightly so. Um, how prepared do you think the Southwest is um, for the challenge that's been set out in this summit? And what do you think it will do for the regional economy if it can get it right? Uh, yeah, I, as a recovering oil and gas engineer, Nick, I really enjoyed the last three days. It's been, it's been fascinating and I've learned an awful lot about hydrogen that I didn't know on Monday. Um, first of all, I think we are in competition with other regions. You know, there's some good good talk about preparation from bays and people and, and covering the whole bit, but we are... You know, there are eight or nine or ten hydrogen hubs already in existence across the UK. So we have to recognise we're in competition, one. Two, I think Paul beautifully described the kind of, um, we, we are well set up for the supply side of hydrogen, even if we're not particularly strong at the moment, with our, with our wave, with our tides, sometimes with our sun. Um, but it's the demand side that, that I saw today, uh, the last two days, is, is fragmented, and we need to pull together our sense um, to make it... Um, Reduce the commercial risks, Nick, and make it cheaper, and encourage investment in both the supply side and and and, and the kind of um, the production and the supply side. Um, so I think we do need a common goal out of this. We need to, to a common goal for the Southwest. We need to, uh, a plan, and we need some leadership, which I think uh, uh, Paul and, and Colin have shown through this summit. Um, I think the wind's in our favour. However, we are we are still, I think, um, a levelling up region. We're not the north, we're not Midlands, but we're certainly not London, the southeast. So that might go in our favour in terms of future government funding. Um, in terms of your second question, Nick, I think um, you know, imagine the spin outs we could get from from you know um, spin outs, and I hear some cooling, cooling cooling engineering and plane structures and all that kind of innovation we could get out of of, of, of a hydrogen industry. Think of all the inspiration of startups, of, of, of people wanting to work in this industry. Think of the talent we could attract from around the UK and across, across the world because, you know, young engineers who want to work in advanced engineering but also want to save the planet. Hydrogen is a fantastic industry to attract young, talented engineers into. Um, and, if, and lastly, and back to Jackie's point, you know, aerospace needs this. Aerospace industry in the southwest is pivotal. It's one major, major, major employer and, and the supply chain is huge. We, you know, it has ambitions, it has challenges. If hydrogen can play its part in taking our aerospace industry into a new generation, then that would be fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Phil. Uh, and of course, I think, you know, again, from a semi-outsider's point of view, what is so exciting about this is that uh, everyone pretty much in the UK will be familiar with the extraordinary history of, of uh, invention and innovation that is vested in the Southwest. Um, you know, we only need to look to, to Bristol's heritage as a center of uh, invention and innovation to, to, to know what a, a part that the region has played in the whole country's um, 
sort of industrial history. Uh, what I what I'm very mindful of, though, is that whilst this is a regional story, we need to keep it in a national perspective. Um, and we've heard a compelling case uh, from, uh, from 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 Gitto about the Welsh hydrogen story. Um, Claire Gibson, uh, head of delivery at Heart of the Southwest LEP, I wanted to ask you, um, Claire, whether the Southwest's effort in hydrogen can not only uh, serve the Southwest's interests but also complement other strategies in other regions. So, for example, from what we heard from Gitto, can that be complemented, do you think, by what the Southwest is planning in its own hydrogen energy revolution? Well, I think it, it has to, really. I mean, if you look at uh, the industries that we've got, um, the transport networks, uh, they don't recognise regional boundaries and therefore we have to make sure that we're collaborating um, across different partnership organisations and so we need to work together and, and this conference has been great in engaging us all to start thinking about this. I mean, certainly from our perspective at the heart of the Southwest Lab, we're just dipping our toe, to be honest, into this. Um, we've got a very strong commitment to clean and increase, inclusive growth and um, writ large in our local industrial strategy. We're just pulling together a delivery plan um, for clean growth so that we're clear about what we can do to play our part to make sure that the region is future-proofed, um, but also trying to capitalise on those opportunities. But we won't be able to deliver it by ourselves. So we need to make sure that we're looking north and working with our friends uh, in the west of England area, across the border uh, to Wales, but also uh, thinking further west down down to Cornwall and obviously to the east we've got we've got Dorset. So we have a real opportunity here by adding value in my view if we collaborate together rather than go it alone and given the discussions that we've had over the last few days uh, that's exactly what the uh, certainly the demand side uh, is going to be doing when you try and look at how you service the transport network for example um, they're not going to be stopping at, at our border um, or the west of England's border they're, they're going to be thinking how you get from Birmingham down uh, to Plymouth and, and Penzance. So, so we, we absolutely need to be working together on this. Thank you, Claire, very much indeed. Actually, I'd like to um, bring Kim and Paul in on that just for a, a moment or two. Uh, Kim, with your uh, sort of God's eye view over the, 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 the national story, the national picture, uh, would you like to add in any way to what Claire has just said about the way the Southwest's plans and strategies can dovetail in uh, in the hydrogen story with other regions. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Nick. Um, I think there's something that's really resonated as a red thread through what everyone said so so far, Jackie, Phil, or uh, Claire, and it's all about the collaboration. I think I've heard a lot around the same. Uh, we, we need to collaborate and understanding we need to see across our natural boundaries, whether as Claire was mentioning their geographic boundaries. So what we see is a region actually in this case could be three or four together and um, looking at a supply chain because supply chains go across across regions and of course the networks do. But there's sectoral boundaries as well because we are talking about that's what we're talking about that aggregated demand. Aerospace and aviation have been in their same tracks for years. When was the last time Airbus maybe spoke to a bus manufacturer to learn something from them? Doesn't happen. Those boundaries need broken down as well as the geographic ones and seeing across those boundaries and understanding we actually can learn from each other and um, across that demand picture um, and the sectors that feed into those demand pictures. 
And then the third aspect is actually technology boundaries. This will maybe become more in Paul's specialism. Um, is is an engineer and, and someone who looks across from that demand side of where's the where are the molecules going to be used? How are we going to transport and store them? How are we going to produce them? When you when you, when you look across that, you're, as an engineer, you're piecing together technologies, and there's gaps and there's question marks and some of that. Those boundaries between the companies they've broken down as well. So there's different layers of boundaries and dimensions. Geographical, which I think was Claire was talking about, sectoral that we've got to look across, and that aggregated demand cross piece, and then regional. In terms of this greater region, shall we call it, um, between Wales, the West, the South West, um, from my perspective, we, this was mentioned earlier actually in, in, in the Q&A session when Adam, in terms of well, how do we compete against other areas that are already started, we know about what's happening in the Humber, there's a lot happening where my accent comes from in Scotland uh, as well, um, and that, for instance, the Orkneys, they've started just taking their own title um, and uh, wave power and competing it. Um, how do you compete? I think it actually starts from looking at the demand. I think it's actually one of your, there's two two strengths this combined region has, maybe three actually. One is some of the existing other solutions don't work, won't apply. Same in, in Scotland, trains and uh, things like that are not going to electrify, so we're not going to put the infrastructure in as much. So they would need more hydrogen in those regions that are more, more rural in other regions, so you may have a demand advantage in some of that. And then there is the supply chain advantage. We've got so much engineering um, bred and weight here because you've got the aerospace industry and Airbus, um, and the time is now because Airbus is the supply chain master, as I referred to earlier, have said, look, we need hydrogen. So again, from an engineering perspective, if you take that, that, that timeline of 2030 and you work back and you work off all of those areas, you can really start to find where is the opportunity? Where is the opportunity? For me, actually, the opportunity will be found in moving quickly because then you grab the knowledge, capital and the advantage. So even if you don't have enough demand to justify all of Alstrom's trains, learning by doing will mean that the knowledge, capital, and the engineering expertise and in the people is held within the region. And that's where I think the opportunity lies. Paul, with that, I'll pass to you. No, I yes, think Paul, please. I'm fascinated by this conversation because I think it is about people. We've got a fantastic cadre of um, people on this call. But, and when we think about it, those companies that we represent are developing really interesting, sustainable-minded people. David and I had a conversation last week with his sustainability team out of EasyJet. Uh, Simon and I had a conversation about you know, Bristol Airport's need to become net zero by 2030. Uh, the motivations of the companies on this call and the employees and the paying public towards a sustainable uh, future, no matter which form of transport, is a definite um, driver for us to build the successful you know, technology. But the technology is actually largely at our doorstep to be able to convert into something that could either fly or go along the rails or be on, on the waters. And we're not far away from that. And Simon and I are also in conversation, Sam Henley and I are talking about, couldn't we revitalize some technology that we developed a, a number of years back and put it into some defense arena that de-risks all of this in a very short time scale? Because one thing that you know, we sometimes forget is we've also got defense on our doorstep in, in, in the Southwest as well. And we couldn't do this without the... Uh, the opportunity to leverage that capability into the mix. So from a technology perspective, I don't think there's a richer region that can pull all of this together. And I, I, I talk about the wider region and, and I spend a lot of time in Wales thinking about, you know, that whole corridor. Um, so I'm really interested in the reflections of David, Simon, Simon and, uh, and, and Guido on, on, on what I've just said. Brilliant, Paul. Thank you. Um, Simon Henley, um, I wanted to turn to you next, if I may. Um, of course, in addition to your role as uh, business and industry strategy advisor at Reaction Engines, you're uh, a past uh, president of the Royal Aeronautical Society. So I want to just widen this out from a sort of um, aerospace uh, uh, God's eye view uh, down. Um, a high-level hydrogen strategy for the UK, as we heard from Ben Harrop 
is on its way and obviously desperately um, needed and, and, and the details of it uh, uh, we need to get our heads around in order to move forward. Um, what should its priorities be, do you think, Simon? And as that ex-president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, what has excited you about this summit's call to action? Well, let, let me deal with the, the second one first, in a way. I think from, from the Royal Aeronautical Society point of view, um, I think it's an incredibly exciting time, and that is really, really vital. Uh, at a time when the aerospace industry, uh, because of COVID, is, is seen as being uh, right now almost close to entry. Um, there are companies that are still running apprenticeships, but, but clearly lots of people are either furloughed or, or laid off at the moment. There is that excitement now that has been generated and literally has come from almost, not quite from nowhere, but certainly vast acceleration in the last year uh, around hydrogen, making aerospace, well, uh, yet again, a really, really exciting place to work, grandchildren. Uh, and when they grow up and, and come out of school, they will be the next generation of potential entries into aerospace. And I know from my time at Reaction Engines, where we've got 200 odd uh, engineers, average age of 34, they will not tolerate our company working with technologies that are continuing to pollute the environment. And that's going to get more and more the case. The, the youngsters who are going to be coming out of school in five years' time simply won't go near industries that are polluting. So the excitement of the acceleration of hydrogen and zero emission technologies in aerospace is going to attract a new generation, new thinking, um, that we can really exploit, and, and that is you know, going to be really, really relevant to the industries in the southwest. As for the strategy, um, I pick up with what Kim was saying earlier really, about the importance of the the end-to-end -end supply chain. Um, there's a lot going on in the user community, and Jacqueline made uh, mention of you know, the funding that's available at the sort of the user end for through things like ATI and various other places. But what is clear is that if all the users uh, accelerate their efforts, which they are doing, then the constraining factor is going to be the supply of hydrogen um, into the UK and the distribution and the storage and the standards that are, that are required to transfer it. And that's the role that I think central government's got to play. And frankly, the UK's hydrogen strategy is late to need if we are to be uh, a leader as an independent nation. Uh, amongst the hydrogen uh, communities. Uh, we really need to know, uh, looking from sort of 2035, what we can postulate pretty easily, what the hydrogen demand is going to be, um, and therefore what decisions we need to be making now in order to make sure that we can satisfy that demand and set priorities for who's going to use hydrogen first. It's very easy to do the things that are the easiest to do. Um, and then find that you've used up all the hydrogen, leaving you the very hard things to do, and you haven't got hydrogen available. To me, transport is probably the hardest thing to decarbonise. Transport, particularly aviation, but lots of others, don't have many options when you're moving stuff around, other than hydrogen as your net zero fuel. Other things that are potential users of hydrogen have options, like, like uh, renewable electricity. And the strategy really needs to set the priorities as to what we're going to do first because they're the most important and then direct every ounce of hydrogen that we have available to the things that can't be done in other ways and that's why to me i'm sitting on my hands anxiously awaiting the hydrogen strategy thanks simon um well uh, ben harrop of bays um thank you for your presentation this morning which uh for me at least you know clarified a number of um, outstanding questions um i just wondered i got a specific question I'll come to you on in a second but I just wondered if there was anything you wanted to uh, add to that um, about um, what Simon's just said. Uh, I mean I think you know Simon's made some really clear and valid points there and, and you know he wouldn't be the first stakeholder to have, to have told us as such. Um, I guess you know we do realize that the, the momentum has increased dramatically you know in the space uh, and that there are a lot of strategies out there already um, which the UK gets compared to 
uh, as I said, you know, we're, we're mindful that a strategy is one thing and, you know, a big sum of cash that sits alongside it is, is good also. But until you get the nuts and bolts right of how you actually make businesses want to invest in this country, um, you, you're really struggling to make that into a kind of coherent picture that pulls this economy through. And so, you know, really that, uh, you know, I, I hear I hear the um, the questioning of, of how we don't have a strategy yet relative to others, and you know, ministers are alive to that. But I, I would say that you know they're also very alive to the fact that they want to get the, the the kind of skeleton right that sits underneath that to actually make it an investable proposition for for countries rather than just sort of you know a, a statement of intent um, as you know some of them some strategies could be suggested as as being. So I, I guess that's um, that's one point I'd make. But you know. As I hope made clear in my presentation, um, we take this really seriously, and and that's not just me as an official saying that. It's not even just my Secretary of State saying that. It's you know it's from the Prime Minister down. Um, you know I, I guess we get it, uh, and we're really trying to move forward. And we do see the the next ten years as a, as a period of action, not just a period of, of sort of warm words. Um, and and yes, again, you know the the kind of the pull them together. The great thing about hydrogen, as I've sort of learned in my job, is is the kind of range of applications, the range of interests. The, the tricky thing about hydrogen is the range of applications and the range of interests, because you've got to pull all that together and do it in a way that, that makes most sense in terms of your emission reduction, that protects all of our money uh, as taxpayers and, and spends that right, and, and does it in a way that brings business with you. Um, so that's kind of the challenge. I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that our strategy will kind of say more to, to answer those. Brilliant, Ben. Thanks very much. Um, Guto, um, I, I, I wondered whether you'd like to come in briefly on that. We heard a great presentation from you this morning about um, the Welsh strategy. Uh, is there anything at this stage, um, particularly in view of what you've heard at the, the summit so far, that um, you can say that might inform um, us pending uh, the arrival of the UK um, hydrogen strategy? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, before that, I just see Kim, you've got your hand up. Did you want to follow in now, follow up now or shortly? Uh, I'm happy to come in later on. Okay, so you go first and I can I can come in later on, it's fine. Yeah, okay. All right. I'll crack on. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, it's fascinating now listening to the discussion. And I'm just going back to what Paul said at the beginning about being long in the tooth, if you don't mind me saying that, Paul, in the <laughs> hydrogen race. Um, I feel maybe a couple of years ago, people were crossing the road to avoid me when I was speaking about hydrogen, and now my proverbial door is being knocked down more often than an Amazon delivery. It really is an exciting time to be in this space. Um, but yeah, as sorry, the previous speakers from Bayes have said, and others as well, it's seen the wood from the trees almost, isn't it? There's so much that can be done, but there has to be some focus on the initial activities and the delivery of those as well. Um, it takes me back almost, you know, this collaboration. It's 2012 since uh, I picked up the phone and phoned Hydrogen Sweden to ask them whether they wanted to bring their European hydrogen grow tour to the UK. So they said yes, and then I panicked and said, OK, let's put on a show. So with Mercedes, Daimler, Toyota and Honda, there was a fleet of fuel cell cars which came to Cardiff. First Minister did a launch here at the Millennium Centre we went on to Bristol. There was council leaders there who were at an event, at a breakfast event, and then on to Swindon, and then on to London at the City Hall, and the Deputy Mayor um, was uh, launching that event. And this is 2012, you know, nearly 10 years ago. So, um, you know, a lot has happened then, but not enough, perhaps. There was talk then of a hydrogen network connecting Wales with the southwest of England. That was the whole point of the, the road tour. It was saying essentially that the technology was ready. Okay, the car that Daimler let me have in my drive overnight just outside my window was worth more than my house. Than my house. But the energy costs have come down rapidly since then and the technology was available. It's even more readily available, but it's that network thing, that chicken and egg debate, which hopefully can go away quickly now. So there has to be collaboration, coordination, and not just in the London area either, because there is a network of filling stations in and around London, but you don't want to spend your life just driving around the M25 
We need to connect across the regions, across the countries, up to Scotland and to Wales as well. So that could be an early hit, yeah? Um, somebody mentioned transports um, just now as one of the hardest to deliver. Um, so transport is an initial key focus, I would have thought, as you cascade into others. And that's why we're co coordinating with the Welsh strategy on transport as an initial market, if you like, matching the supply with the demand. And the Hollyhead Hydrogen Hub is almost a microcosm of that, looking at transport applications, but also obviously working with Wales and West Utilities, with the South Wales Industrial Cluster, with the North East Wales Industrial Cluster on hydrogen for decarbonising those markets as well. This is one of the problems. So much can be done, but it's also one of the appeals, isn't it? But looking at what Germany is doing, the EU, countries around the world, I don't think it's too controversial to say that maybe the UK and Wales is a little bit behind the game, but you can catch up and hopefully rapidly accelerate. And looking at Scotland's hydrogen strategy recently as well, everything is pivoting in the same kind of direction, but it's a case of cracking on. Literally, if you're looking at electrolysis or steam methane reformation and getting some products in on the market. Fabulous. Thank you. Kim, would you like to come in on that? Just before you do, actually, I'm having a few problems with my uh, hand up icon. So if anyone has a question, if they want to jump in, just please make your presence felt with a with a with a yell. Um, Kim, over to you. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. There was, a, there was a couple of key things that I wanted to pick up on there and put uh, um, some numbers and, and, and some um, meat on the bone behind. So one is around the production and the gap. I think it was Simon who picked up on it. So in the government's 10-step plan, step two hydrogen is for production of five gigawatts. If you look at the national grid scenarios, long-term scenarios of demand for energy across the UK, they're saying you could be seeing hydrogen demand of 42 to 47 gigawatts in the same sort of horizon time. So there's your gap. There's some sizings of your gap already. What we've got in the government's 10 step plan number two is a tenth of the demand that's required. So as much as we are looking at other places and it's right that we look at green and, and CCUS and other hydrogen options, it's right to look across the piece. There's still an opportunity there and I think... I still think there's an opportunity to look at nuclear um, as well as part of that mix for, um, for, for feedstock electrons. To be fair to government, though, um, I, one thing I observed from that uh, helicopter view, um, standing back and, and independent, is government want to help, but they need a clear, cohesive voice from industry to say how almost... Uh, I'm not averse to being a bit bossy sometimes and telling people what to do and I think sometimes it's useful if you want to galvanise action. Because the industry voice and demand voices are segregated, government are getting pulled in different directions. So I think industry needs to collaborate and help t with government understand where and how is the right time for them to build the bridge. Government and public sector play a role in bridging from feasible technology to commercially feasible which is a big, is the technology value of that, helping us take the risky bits of getting the, getting the action learning by doing first prototype end-to-end -end projects and helping create the right environment for that bridge is how government, I think, will bridge us to that commercially viable price point. And the key around that is we do need to look at the technology maturity within that. And what I mean by that is... Right now, green hydrogen is five times the cost of grey. Five times. That's very equivalent for us in aviation and aerospace to know that SAF and biofuels is three times across the kerosene jet A1 fuel. But look at what's happened in solar and things in the past. Where you start acting, you bring that differential down quite quickly. And that's where I think government's role is, is in helping. And finally, we mentioned risk before and commercial risk. This is another area where I think we can bring in examples of where industry has solved problems in the past. The energy industry always has commercial risk. You don't build oil rigs without commercial risk. How do we manage that? Joint ventures, we share it. We share it across companies um, and, and balance it. Um, that's part of it. Again, government provided an environment that gives you a floor as part of that de-risking piece. But actually, joint ventures is collaboration. It's working across com com companies 
the example of the consortium led approach in um, Copenhagen, I think, is is exactly the way we, we, we should we should be going. And the other aspect of that collaboration, a big blocker to that technology collaboration, is competitiveness, as we all want to com to, to keep our own uh, IP, which is absolutely understandable and right for commercial advantage. But we've ways in other industries to fix that as well. Because if you want to share competitively sensitive information, you have a clean team in the middle. So what you do in M&A deals, you can do the same thing in technology. I've seen it done in joint ventures before. You can do the same thing in technology. So we have tools from other industries. We can be risk. There is an opportunity with that size of production gap still there. Um, and, and really, we need to just get moving to be able to bring down that commercial differential. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Kim, very much. Um, you raised some very interesting points there, and I want to bring in David Morgan now. Um, David, uh, as Director of Flight Operations and Lead on Future Flight uh, of for technology at EasyJet, uh, what would EasyJet, or what indeed have you learned from what you've um, heard uh, about the um, initiative in the Southwest as presented over the past couple of days, and what role potentially might EasyJet play in it, do you think? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's fabulous to be here, and it's no coincidence that, that we've got an airline here. I mean, uh, this is about our, our very existence uh, in the future. And, you know, we absolutely see hydrogen uh, playing a major role in the survival um, of, of aviation going forward. And, and people sometimes ask me, you know, where about in the in a portfolio of, of short, medium, long haul, you know, does hydrogen sit? Well, actually, I believe it sits right across the portfolio because, you know, at, at the lower end of the scale with hydrogen fuel cells, um, you know, potentially moving into hydrogen combustion for, for longer ranges and, and, and where there is no kind of feasible solution at the moment, um, you know, power to liquid fuels uh, using hydrogen uh, for, for those really hard to abate uh, areas of, of aviation, um, you know, is, is absolutely applicable. So we are, we are very much committed to uh, supporting industry develop this infrastructure that's going to be needed. Uh, and a few colleagues have said it earlier, but, you know, the wonderful thing about hydrogen is that it doesn't really matter, you know, where, where you create it. Once you've got hydrogen, you can use it in such a wide range of applications. Uh, and it's going to be vitally important for us to understand uh, and start using it uh, wherever we can, as early as possible, whether it's around the airport environment and so on. Um, and the Southwest is a, is a fantastic place, um, you know, a, a, apart from being a Welshman, which I, I myself, being born in Cardiff, so I feel very at home here. Um, you know, we can see this as almost the, the spiritual heart place, but potentially of, of uh, uh, hydrogen into to aviation. And nothing would give me greater pleasure than to be able to operate uh, an EasyJet uh, zero emissions aircraft out of Bristol Airport um, as a kind of showcase uh, in the future. I think it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, when you look at uh, an airline like EasyJet, which is one of the largest airlines in the world, well, um, you know, 75% of our flights, our network, are less than 1,000 miles and 40% are less than 600 miles. So you really start to bring uh, this technology into reach um, for, for the sort of applications that we need. Um, and, uh, and so I'm very excited to be here and, and we see uh, ourselves playing a major role in supporting um, the industry. Uh, we, we are obviously well connected with, with governments and, and industries and so on. Uh, and we want to do our part in, in bringing this into play. Wonderful. Um, thank you, David. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, actually, as, uh, as, as good luck would have it, uh, next to uh, you on my screen is, uh, is Simon Earls, who is uh, Planning and Sustainability Director for Bristol Airport. Um, hi, Simon. I, I, I wanted to bring you in because I wanted, if you could, to tell us a little bit about going beyond the pure platform side of aviation. What, uh, tell us a little bit about the joined up hydrogen ecosystem that, that, that actually flows from the aircraft themselves into infrastructure. 
and and what what can Bristol Airport do to sort of um, lay that out so that we can see the entire ecosystem from platform to even things like uh, ground transportation. Nick, thank you. Hello, everyone. And um, a, a really uh, inspiring session and, and does leave me with uh, the thought, what, what's really stopping this region from becoming a global centre for clean aviation growth with hydrogen right in the centre of center of that? And, and David, let's, uh, let's make that inaugural flight happen. That would be a, a wonderful thing <laughs> to see. So, um, I mean, what's the role uh, that Bristol Airport can play in all of this, um, I think fundamentally, I see it as a, a role of as a test bed. Um, we uh, obviously we're, we're an infrastructure provider. That's that's what we do. We, we supply facilities for customers like EasyJet to uh, to um, support their network. Um, we are a contained environment, so a privately owned site. Yes, it is highly regulated, but it um, does, in a contained site, provide the opportunity for us to do things that might uh, be more challenging elsewhere. Um, of course, we um, we can provide incentives for our customers to create the right environment for this technology uh, to be uh, to be trialled. You know, we're proud to be part of one of the recently uh, funded future flight consortia where the airport's been used as a real life test test bed for, for some of that new technology and but as you say nick the, the other thing that the airport does offer is is multiple use cases so um whether it's uh hydrogen flight uh whether it's hydrogen ground equipment as david mentioned earlier or, or if it's if indeed it's the, the buses that arrive at our public transport interchange from around the region or indeed the buses that run around our site you know we've got multiple opportunities to apply the technology in in that um, and that environment and, and i suppose the last thing that that um, i think that bristol airport can do to help is to have that desire and ambition to make things happen so you know we we, we, we have been following a fairly ambitious strategy for some time to reduce our carbon emissions um we we have managed to de decouple those from growth so we've seen co2 a passenger half in the last 10 years during a period notwithstanding this year where we've seen almost exponential growth but the scope three element of course of of the footprint is the massive one and whilst we've seen some very significant steps in that so the uh, Airbus Neo that uh, we see a lot of David's team flying in and out of the airport, 15% fewer carbon emissions than its predecessor. You know, those are massive steps. You know, the wings designed um, in in our in our region. You know, we need bigger steps, and we need those bigger steps to to come sooner rather than later. And, and the role we can play is um, to help to showcase that, and um, not only by making them happen in the region, but uh, I think also um, acted as a, uh, an exemplar internationally and nationally. So, that, I mean, the UK industry in aviation has, has taken a, a really impressive leadership position when it comes to decarbonisation. The, the Sustainable Aviation Net Zero Roadmap was the first global example of a sector coming together to, uh, to um, uh, commit to net zero. Big focus on SAF. We, you know, we need that uh, that organisation to now turn its attention to other areas such as uh, such as hydrogen. And I suppose the last, the last thing that we can do is the gateway into the region. In um, 2019, nine million passengers came through our front door. There's a great platform there to showcase the brilliant things that are happening in the region, and to introduce technologies like hydrogen to. Uh, to our customers, and, and that's something we should take advantage of. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Simon, um, very much indeed. Um, ben Rhodes, uh, Deputy Director Southwest at the CBI. Um, uh, none of us need reminding. It's been a terrible year, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, how critical is it for the region, if you could just paint a picture 
uh, for me and the rest of uh, the audience. Um, how, how critical is the Green Revolution to the recovery of the region? Thanks, Nick. Um, I mean, it's incredibly critical, and I, I certainly agree with others on the call that there's a there's a great opportunity here for the southwest. Um, and I agree with Phil as well that that actually the competition is incredibly stiff. Uh, and and in order for the region really to to grasp this opportunity, we have to make sure that we're we're collaborating and coordinating our response when we're talking to government um, uh, in in order to have any impact whatsoever. Um, I, I guess understandably, just taking a step back and thinking about what some of the things some of the things raised during the call, um, the CBI is focusing very heavily on government policies and and importantly the regulatory frameworks that we're going to need to try and enable this technology, these technologies, and and the, and the appropriate supply of hydrogen. Um, that, that they'll require. So, you know, we're, we've got some really clear asks of government that, that at the top level that, that really will will help to sort of um, push push these technologies forward and the availability of hydrogen. Uh, and I'll, I'll just run through them very briefly because I think it's quite important. Um, certainly somebody mentioned, I think Kim mentioned that, that actually being really clear about what we're after is, is really important. Um, so, so firstly, um, you know, we're calling on government to introduce some variations uh, to the contracts for difference auctions um, to really allow some of the some of the um, fixed uh, costs, the capex costs uh, and the variable cost of production to be recouped. Uh, we're calling on a significant investment in terms of the um, hydrogen testing programs and de demonstration projects across across the country. So uh, a billion pounds we're asking the government to invest in production stories and distribution. And I guess importantly as well, we're, we're asking for an update to the gas safety management regulations um, which will, will allow greater flexibility for the injection of hydrogen into the into the gas grid. So some really key asks of government from the CBI at the national level to try and support. You know, it is a great opportunity for the South West, but the country as a whole. Fabulous. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, Toby, Toby Savage, um, Leader South Gloucestershire Council and Deputy Mayor um, Wecker. Um, uh, my question to you actually is sort of, born of um, personal experience as well. I, I, I think, I hope I've got this right, in a former life you were a communicator. Um, your uh, your, your um, private sector business was in communications. Um, as a, a storyteller uh, myself, I, um, I'd really like to hear how you feel the Southwest tells its story going forward to sort of deliver maximum impact. As I said earlier, you've got a fantastic history of invention and innovation. How do you capture this, do you think, Toby, and, 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 and sort of tell it uh, to its maximum, maximum advantage so the story is heard where you need it to be heard? Um, yeah, th yeah, thank you for that, that introduction and the, and the question. So, um, you mentioned a few of the uh, sort of roles that I have. I think the, the, the role that I've got, um, which I, I want to focus on um, in answering now, is, is my role as Deputy Chair of the Western Gateway, um, because I think that um, it's important to recognise that, that that Western Gateway region, you know, that is spanning a really wide uh, geography, Swansea to, to Wiltshire, uh, Gloucester to Salisbury. Um, but I think what that you know, as our equivalent in our area to the Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine, uh, that that gives us the flexibility to work with neighbours in in all directions and to, and to and to be flexible um, where we've got projects that that, that demand this and, and 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 as we've heard from speakers, there's so much um, uh, that we we can point to within our region that that, that shows the potential that we've got to really embrace embrace this agenda and I think there are, there are two two projects that, that I do help to bring to life the story um, and that is the the submission that we'll be doing tomorrow um, as a region to support the Great Western Freeport bid. But that's a really exciting opportunity to um, to be able to help new businesses to cluster um, within our region um, and, and you know we've we've got a very strong strong case, um, and and are, are pulling out all the stops to make to make that uh, to be able to pull that off. And then the second one, which we'll be actually submitting at the end of next month, will be um, a bid uh, to 
um, that we're working with colleagues across uh, nuclear southwest um, for a fusion uh, prototype uh, site nomination for that because of our strong um, uh, nuclear background within the region uh, the, the sites um, that, that, that we know we've got including within my own authority at, at Oldbury um, and that's a really important opportunity for us to be able to land a key hydrogen uh, asset um, within within the region where as we've heard there's such a strong um, skill sets um, and, and industry that can can that can really help us help us with that um, as, as a Western gateway we, we, we all need to be working together to tell that story um, and actually uh, a, a plug that in the not uh, in in the next couple of weeks um, we want to be uh, advertising for some additional business representatives um, to, to join us on, on the Western gateway in order to uh, um, you know help you know, myself as, as, as deputy chair, um, Catherine Bennett as our chair, um, you know, a key figure in aerospace um, locally, and, and, and you know, no, no surprise given the importance of aerospace uh, on both sides of the Severn uh, estuary, um, as well as my my colleague uh, Jane Mudd, um, who's the also a, a, the deputy chair of Western Gateway, and she's the leader of Newport City Council. Um, so. We can all uh, help to tell the story, um, uh, and most importantly for me, to, you know, telling that story back to ultimately the people that we're all doing this for, which is the residents um, within within the region who, who look to us as political leaders and business leaders and, and other stakeholders to make sure that we can un un unleash the full potential of our region and, and, and the people within it. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Toby. Um Helen, Helen Isles, um, I, I come to you, and I'm sorry, uh, sorry for the wait, but we've had a lot of panellists to get through. But yours is an important um, task here, Helen. Um, as Senior Policy Advisor, West of England Combined Authority, uh, can you talk us through what role you think WECA can play in aligning the region uh, and central government in particular behind initiatives such as this? And... You know, I'm reminded you know, from everything that I've heard today and the last couple of days, which is very exciting. When I go to big aerospace exhibitions um, internationally, you often see um, clusters, you know, cluster regions being uh, 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 sold very successfully internationally. I wonder how exportable you think this initiative can be to the rest of the world. Uh, yeah, so thanks very much. Um, I think the, the, the role that the West of England Combined Authority can play is similar to the roles that we've all, all talked about, about collaboration and the themes that, that Claire and Toby have picked up on in terms of kind of working as those convener roles, thinking about the, the regional geography um, and how we can set those directions going forward and working with our partners in industry. Um, so as the West of England, uh, we have a declared a climate emergency. We want to be carbon neutral by 2030. So very much any of these ambitions kind of are in line with that. And we would want to see how we could kind of drive that forward. Uh, I think we've all been quite open in our kind of declaration of a climate emergency in that we don't know the direct pathway to achieve that carbon neutrality. So we're looking for different ways that we can innovate recognising that the West of England does have that strong history of aerospace engineering, of innovation, and we would want to be able to build on that. But then also recognising that we do need to work quite closely in partnership with our industry partners and government. We're not going to tackle this alone. So I think a role for kind of anyone here uh, is around that collaboration role, really, and that coordination role, um, being that foot spokesperson between government, industry, our unitary authorities, our businesses, our residents, talking around thinking about what the appropriate geography is so that we have that kind of key and consistent ask. I think we've all spoken about how, um, you know, hydrogen has a wealth of opportunities and uh, chances that we could all take advantage of. It's about understanding how we can drive that forward, really, and, and what the opportunities are going forward and having that consistent ask. And I think that's something that... Um, you know, as a combined authority, we will hold our hands up to that's something that we need to probably do a bit more in, uh, investigation around. And that's where I think we would look to industry to kind of help and guide around that as well. 
in terms of kind of um, yeah, it being able to kind of the attractiveness uh, across the global uh, world, I think it's certainly there. This is obviously something that, you know, increasingly as we, the UK is a, it has a presidency for COP26, um, it's uh, eyes are on us as a country around what's going on. Anyone that can be taking those first bits of innovation producing these products and, and being able to, to go from there and, and make it a saleable or providing a clear pathway and providing that technology, providing that advice and guidance is going to be in a, in a winning position, certainly. Just can I add to that, Nick? I mean, I'm, I'm getting constant calls from Californian startups in hydrogen who want to come to the UK. Um, and, you know, it's a great point in time where, I think we can exercise these capabilities on our shores and actually become world leaders in something. And I think the Southwest particularly has an interest in uh, things like composites and containing and storage. I think Simon picked up on that point earlier. There, there are some really fundamental technology challenges that have been solved or are being solved only in the UK, in the Southwest. And so, I mean, I would add to that, you know, uh, Helen, in terms of, you know, it isn't just about us putting ourselves on the world stage to export. There's also the inward investment opportunities that will come from this. The key thing for me also, the key thing for me also, Nick, is we've lost the capability in the southwest of having that infrastructure around the Fulton Airfield. Huge developments historically came out of that BA Systems and formerly, you know, the Bristol Aerospace Company. And um, we've got to look at our assets around the region and, as Paul's just said, sell that expertise so that companies like Zero Avia know that they can come into a place, uh, maybe Exeter, maybe oh, we've got Virgin Orbits going into nuclear, so we can do this, but we've got to draw people into the region as well as trying to export out. We will export out once we've maintained the skills and gained the thing, but, but it, it is all a balance that we've got to... Fabulous. Um, thanks, Colin. And um, I'm conscious that we are sort of racing towards the bottom of the hour. We've, we've got about another 10 or 15 minutes or so. Uh, before I turn this over to uh, Paul and Colin again, because what I want to do is see how we can corral what we have learned over the past three days. What can we batten down in terms of um, what we've learned in terms of commitments in terms of who will do what and roadmaps so that we can begin to cement a kind of charter going forward um, to turn all of this enthusiasm and excitement into something real happening and which can be uh, 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 submitted as a showcase for what the region can do. So before I turn to, uh, to, to, to Colin and uh, Paul Pereira about that, um, I just want to see if any of the panel has a question. We've probably got time for a, a question or two. Uh, just raise your hand if you have, uh, because I think now I've got to you all. Uh, if there aren't any questions... I think um, Phil had his hand up there, if I can... Phil. Okay. I think you have an old hand, Nick. Thank you. Go ahead. That was an old hand, Nick. I think we just oh, said that. Hand. Good. All right. Splendid. Um, so uh, that being the case, Colin and Paul, um, in the 10 or 15 minutes or so that's available to us, Paul, first of all, would you like to summarize what we've heard? And yes. in terms of takeaways, what is it that you want to grasp and sort of move forward with from all of this? So I think that the first thing is there's a beginning to be an alignment of the common vision. We have to write it down. And, and if we're not all going to be putting our name to a piece of paper with our signatures on it, um, then we will all possibly walk in different directions from this call. So my pledge to you is to try and, with Kim and, and maybe Simon's help, put together a single page. This is a statement and pledge that we all would like to sign up to. Because once we've got that in our frame and our, and our wall and in every conversation – we can then begin to act against it. So I think that, Kim, if you're happy with the, the support you've been giving to um, this whole conurbation around the hydrogen community of the Southwest, we'll have a go at that. The second thing that I picked up out of this uh, series of conversations is 
how important, and I think, Simon, you picked on it, skills really is. We have a real challenge. I'm a board member of the Ingenuity, what was SEMTA, um, as a non-exec, and we can see a real challenge. Not that we haven't got jobs that are going to be coming, but we haven't got them right now. And so we need them for the purposes of getting the careers defined. I know, Ben, you've put some comments there. We really need to get that link up between the skills part of the bays and your hydrogen strategy so that we've got the right kind of um, education. Right now, I've been told there are gaps in our knowledge across the UK, which we can't plug, even on programs as significant as Fly Zero. I know that I spoke to uh, Zeravia. They're trying to recruit heavily in hydrogen fuel cells. I'm pretty sure my predecessors a company in GKN is struggling to find the right people as well as we start having all the money. But if the people aren't there to go and make these uh, great ideas real, then we won't have a solution. So we need to get the skills piece going pretty quickly. And then the money does come. We do need to build on the back of your great work, uh, Ben, on the hydrogen strategy to put some really foundational building blocks that are, that are significant. And Simon Earls and I have been talking about what we could do with you know, getting moving on hydrogen on the apron. You know, are there things now where we could start putting the um, the basis of a, a hydrogen airport down so that we've got real operations rather than wait for another 10 years and then discover it's too late? And, you know, David's already ordered his hydrogen aircraft from someone um, that we're actually there ready to take the first flight, as you said. And I'd love to be on that flight with David. So those are my little takeaways. But I've what I would take away from all of this is there's a real passion and commitment across the communities. And I wanted to thank you all for being here with us in this journey. And over to you, Colin, in terms of your takeaways. Yes, thank you, Paul, and thank you for, for all the panellists. I was, I was just commenting to my good lady who's, uh, who's been watching what we've been doing over the last three days. I think one of the things I've learned and one of the positives of COVID, I could not have got all you people as panellists in a room prior to COVID. So that is a big plus that we're able to speak. Um, the key thing for me and why I set this up after discussions is... Um, I fundamentally learned during my time at Leonardo, especially doing research and development and technology scouting for them across Europe, is um, the Europeans and our competitors work much more regionally. They invest into a regional structure uh, and then they support within the region in terms of what their industry is doing. Um, we have a bit of a fragmented approach within the English setup, uh, and I don't want to go into the politics of RDA against LEPs. We are where we are, and we have to move forward. But I think we need a call to arms in terms of uh, a drawing together an action um, series of series of people to talk about the industrial side, and then work with the geopolitical side to get a message, to get an ask in terms of what we're going to do. Um, what is actually achievable in terms of tangible things? So, for instance, do we actually want to press for a large-scale electrolyzer or hydrogen production facility to support the Southwest? Key thing for me on what I've learned on the supply side. We need to, we need to work that out. We then also then need to understand is once we've got a potential supply coming through, what are we going to use the hydrogen we're producing for? And um, the other key thing is I really learned in terms of how much more cross-sector uh, innovation um, will be needed within this, this new ecosystem, whereas before in the past we've probably been very sort of sector-driven uh, and in our silos and never the twain shall meet. Certainly the uh, inspiration that came from what rail needs and what rail is doing will give us a short-term demand cycle while we can concurrently develop the skills and the projects coming out of Fly Zero and the work that Airbus will do. Because again, if we can get people working in rail and then build up skills on hydrogen fuel cells, there will be then transferable skills when we start thinking about the aircraft systems in manufacture. So it we are in the start, we're almost 
you know, sim, you know, it's always the tortoise and the hare. It doesn't mean that because we're slightly late in game moving as a region, that ultimately we can't get to the finish line ahead uh, of other parts. I think there is time. I think there are opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, the key thing for me is we've really got to do something. We've really got to identify whether it's small-scale developments going down to SMEs through a, a net zero equivalent of NATAP or the DASA projects, whether it's uh, what the supply chain is going under the fantastic projects like GKN and the, the hydrogen project in aerospace, what we can do in terms of bus uh, and truck and and maybe uh, ground support equipment in the early days for things like Bristol Airport, you know, to get them used to the new technologies, be it electric, be it hydrogen. I think we've just got to get going. That's the key thing for me. Let's get a group, a call to arms. I've already talked to Phil Smith from the Industrial Stars, and Ben sits on my board. Uh, I've, I've said earlier today that I've got a, uh, a website that we're going to launch called Southwest E-Tech, Zero Emissions Technology and Engineering Cluster that we can draw ourselves and put stuff up for the Southwest. I'm sure Phil and Ben and I can work together and corral the, 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 the big primes then and work out what we're going to do. And then if we can then bring together the Western Gateway, the Grads, Great Southwest, um, and uh, the LEPs, the, the West of England, G4, uh, and down into Dorset, heart of the Southwest and Cornwall, I think we can really start to collate a message which then supports uh, Ben and the team in Bayes and then cross sections of DFT, and we mustn't discuss, we mustn't forget the implications we've got to do that into the Department of Education, because we all talk about skills, but Bayes and DFT don't educate our, our, our children on our, our university students, that's in uh, the Department of Education. So there's a lot to do. Uh, I think we're on the starting line, but I think we can catch up, and I really firmly believe we've got a great future. So I guess the next step, Nick, for me would be, you know, we want to document some of this conversation. Hopefully those that are on this call would be happy for us to provide a recording back to them, but also for us to use it as the content to create the first draft of what that strategy might look like um, and get your support to taking it that next step further in line with the hydrogen strategy work that central government's doing. So we've got three months. If everyone wants to do it, give me a thumbs up, then we'll get going. <laughs> Well, I'm seeing uh, seeing lots of thumbs up there, Paul, um, and that's a brilliant note uh, on which to uh, to end. And I note uh, just as positively that we are um, ahead of the curve in terms of the um, the schedule and the time the the, the the agenda. So well done, everyone. Um, it just remains for me, obviously, to thank everyone on the panel. Uh, it was an extremely interesting. Um, an educational discussion uh, for me and I know for the audience as well. Um, Paul and Colin, I'm going to hand back to you and thank you for a wonderful event. Both of you, it's been terrific. Uh, and thanks for having me on board. Well, again, thank you, Nick, for joining us on this uh, and, and taking the time. To, you, know, you, you, know, you, you are one of my um, inspirations for doing something about climate action. So thank you for being that leader and showing us the way to communicate and uh, and really helping us through this journey. So. Again, thank you. And all of the panel, I'm sure, will have enjoyed the conversation. So let's not leave this thought without uh, taking the action that uh, we've committed to. So um, I will stay on for a few more minutes as we've got that time, and I'll answer any questions that have popped up in the chat. But uh, by all means, uh, you can ju just leave now, or you can continue on to listen to what we've, um, we've got in the questions and see if we can answer some of them. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Frank. So, um, well, thank you all again, and uh, um, I'll leave the teams going, and those that have to leave, then um, thank you. And uh, I can see lots of applause in a way of thumbs up. I think this platform has allowed us, uh, Colin, as you said, to do something subtly different, and what I'm really okay. pleased by is um, how much great attendance that we've had throughout. So, firstly, again, thanks to the audience that stayed with us. You know, we've got 100 people on the, on day three of a, a fairly long and enduring conference, and uh, and I would say some really clear actions coming from each of the sessions. Um, I want to say a special thanks to uh, two people on this uh, team who have kept with me through my little journey, and uh, Kim, Simon, particularly. You know, every Friday we 
try and catch up and keep moving the ball on. And David, thank you specifically for being that constant support since I came with a few ideas to you. Um, so let's keep that going. And uh, I hope Ben and Ben, you'll continue the journey with us. Um, so thanks for joining us. And if you'd like to, you know, we'll continue our Friday calls where all this is happening, Kim. So maybe we should extend the audience. It might make our jobs a little bit easier. Indeed, happy to happy to, 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 to invite anyone that wants to join our, our call, our regular catch-ups on this. Yeah, and, and, and really, seriously, uh, it, Ben, I think we, we, we recognise there's a, a big big strategy, and but I think there's some people on this call that can really help uh, with that. <laughs> Anything that we can do to support you, um, you know, please do get us involved. I think that's the key message from us, Ben, is, is we're, we want to do something and we want to give you as much information to help you do your job in Bayes um, and get this communication flow going. So Ben was about to say something. So. No, just, just to reinforce what, what you guys said before about having trying to bring one voice for the region. I know that that isn't always an easy thing to do, but there's actually some really good examples of, of places that have, are doing a good job of that. Uh, I mean, I know Orkney was mentioned a little while ago, and they're actually a great example of, you know, taking what was actually a problem. They didn't have a good enough, you know, connection to the mainland to all the all the electricity they were making, and saying, well, what can we do with that instead? And so becoming, uh, you know, a hydrogen hub and kind of storming along from there. You know, likewise, some of the industrial clusters have done a good job of, of basically bringing together uh, a kind of disparate group of, well, relatively disparate group of industries and saying, well, here's how we would do it, uh, you know, to, to, to decarbonise our whole operations uh, using hydrogen and, and indeed using other technologies as well. So, um, you know, play to your strengths and, and, and come together as one voice because as much as I'd love to, you know, it's very difficult to meet every kind of company that might be on this call, but hearing uh, how a region wants to do that and, and how government can help um, is, is a good way of doing that. And Ben, just on that point, we, we, we think the region's slightly broader, you know, with the, the conurbation that sits across the water. Simon and I spent a bit of time with the Welsh government. I mean, we think that they've got a, a really good plan ahead. We, we're going to be complementary with what we're doing rather than competing. And I think that's also important. And, you know, from a, a top-down perspective, I think, David, you know, we need a solution that works in all parts of the country. It doesn't have, you know, it can't, and out of all parts of the world. So we need to step ahead and start making some real moves now in unison. So I think, David, you, you'd only enforce that you know, we can't have an aircraft with only one hub in the UK. No, no, no. I'd like to pick up on that piece precisely, um, Paul. Uh, ben, what I would say is uh, watch the states on this. You know, now Biden's in power, they're going yeah. to move fast. And if we don't, they won't come up. But uh, uh, the fact we've got the ability now to possibly partner with them and make a global solution that is led by a, a maybe a transatlantic partnership and this sort of thing could be very interesting. The other aspect I think that we've got at our hands, we've, Paul and I were talking about learning from ventilator, look at what we've managed with vaccines, with regulation. Mm. By having that in our hands in our own timeline, look how we've managed to accelerate that. I think that's actually quite interesting from a UK, USP or, or, or control as well we've got control of that I think I think I think for me if you look back in history and look at the energy changes you know the introduction of steam and the switch from steam to then diesel they happen quite rapidly and I think once the demand signal and even the internet once things actually happen industry can actually develop things very rapidly and the ventilator challenge proved that i think the key thing is to get the momentum going and actually so i think the catalyst is david and uh, i mean I, I i think with the airlines pushing like you david to really embrace uh, the net zero economy and trying to make sure that the oems get the right solution in place and thanks for the leadership on that i mean what are your thoughts about how we can help you in any way you know, I think it's been fascinating and it's been a real privilege to be speaking to people who are so passionate about the subject, uh, you know, as, as we are. And, um, you know, we just put two people into the Fly Zero program on secondment from EasyJet. And um, I would really like to see that program driving into something that materialises in the southwest, frankly. And, you know, so I think, you know, if we can get some tangible results out of that, um, as part of the, the program, and I'd be very happy to facilitate, uh, you know, discussions 
um, outside of the formal discussions, if you like, with Apply Zero together with the people that we have within the team. Yeah. Uh, uh, with well, others so that we can start to understand what that means. That's really helpful. Well, I do, I do have a... I just have a picture in my head, having sat on the, the Welsh Government Hydrogen Reference Group and listened to the, the development of their strategy and effectively, the, for want of a better word, the hydrogen highway coming down the M4. Um, and given uh, Kim's uh, stark expose on the figures of the, the, level of, the current level of ambition and the 10-point plan versus the likely need for hydrogen, you know, we will be a net importer. Mm. And please God, it's, it's green hydrogen, not, not brown or blue hydrogen. Yeah. Well, blue maybe, but you know, carbon capture to me is going to be an issue anyway. Um, you know, I could just you could just see that the nucleus, as well as the, the stuff that's supposedly going to be coming ashore from the North Sea um, into the sort of northeast as a as a hub, um, Wales as an importer of green hydrogen from those that have an excess, whether it's a stranded UK site, so somebody like Orkney mm. that's got natural resources but doesn't isn't connected into the grid. Or if it's Saudi that's actually got half the desert turned to solar energy producing ammonia and it comes ashore as ammonia, mm. but then comes down in either ammonia form or in hydrogen form down the M4 with little spurs coming in with what's going on in Wales in terms Absolutely. of buses and some of those other things, mm. ending up in Bristol Airport, starting with the ground equipment, the buses, the things we could do, frankly, now. Um, and then, as we get to aeroplanes, um, and David, when we do get to get you to uh, react engines, we can talk about whether we can use ammonia um, in a neotype uh, aeroplane rather than have to wait for a brand new hydrogen aeroplane. Um, all of those things, you, you can really see something building almost starting now, and that's what I'd, I'd but you know, just I think you see should, whether we can do anything with that. Simon, I think that picture that you've articulated is exactly what's in my head, and uh almost to the, the you know, point. I think this, this, uh, the Western Wales is going to be the key to this. And I think that there's huge amounts of uh, capacity to make that vision real. Uh, and I think that now's the time to, to write it down and then make it real. We so, do uh, need, we need some reconnaissance though, though of, of the M5 corridor as well. And the advantages that bringing you to the, to the picture, including places like Exeter, Airport in terms of development hub, as I said, because we've lost Fulton, that we can trial things at Exeter under a more safe regime and then feed them into what is a very busy airport in Bristol, but look at it as a community across the southwest and Wales so that when we go to government, we get the bigger ask and therefore we get more oomph because what I have found, if you, if you put it down into smaller areas, the government will pick it off and put it into the larger regional message in terms of like the Tees Valley or the Northwest because they get more bangs for their bucks. So yeah, it's part of the mix. You, you've invited yourself to our Friday Hydrogen uh, Strategy Club. So uh, you're very well. Oh, I'm, pre I'm pretty passionate, as you can well imagine. The other thing I want to, do, I want to prevent from the wrong people staying is the experience with Leonardo had is since I'm, I'm absolutely passionate about the regions and also tapping into that European money that the government, through the Brexit deal, is going to pump into Horizon Europe. We have a funding pot there that we should go after because the Europeans will go after it. Certainly the UK and the regions should go after that because our government is going to contribute to it. So I think that is another uh, facet in terms of getting development projects under Clean Sky 2. We know they fund tangible development projects in reality, physical things, not studies. And I think going forward under Horizon Europe, the next phase of Clean Sky 3, if it is that, will maybe help us get things like that infrastructure into Bristol Airport. Uh, and so I think we've got two doors to knock on, as well as, uh, you know, as Westminster and maybe uh, Cardiff. I think Europe could also a door on in terms of getting... So, Colin, we. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got to jump off on Say so thank you. No, thank you again, David. I, I didn't want to uh, hold you up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. And I'll catch up really soon. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Simon. Thank we'll talk soon. We'll catch you up soon. We'll get that visit in sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, those will be open anyway. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I'll stay. And just to say, everyone who's remained on the platform uh, with us to, to this end, um, Colin, I just want to say thank you for your support in pulling this.
for your team. I don't think I've uh, been able to thank you enough. And I think there's a lot of people still online as we get to the end of our meeting. Um, you yeah, I'd like to. Th I'd like to thank yourself and Nick and and Kim in helping us put this together. Uh, also, you know, a bit of name check for people like Corin Matthews from the Heart of Southwest, and also Anthony Merritt from the West of England, uh, and also my team, um, Belinda Austin, uh, who was ill with COVID, and, and and we were worried about her before uh, before Christmas. So again, you know keep safe everybody we're still not out of the tunnel but we're getting there um sam hamlin who does all the all the events background work and, and does the donkey work and terminally dinner who's helped me on the it and done all the graphics and the information i've got a fantastic team uh and i hope it's been it's very you know it's been a learning curve for us but i think uh in terms of the event i could have asked for more i think it's really hit the nail on the head and, and given us an opportunity to get this uh exciting agenda onto the top of the top of the conversation so thank you again paul for helping me get through this um both it and both for for moderating uh, and I'm sure we'll do the other one. I think the next one we've got to think about is electrification and in terms of cross sector technologies. So, what you might not know, Colin, I just peered at who's still online. There's 81 people still here, even the, the Trade Commissioner and the High Commissioner of Canada. So, we've got an amazing audience. So, I want to say thank you one last time for all those that have stuck with us. Um, it's really impressive to see the passion, commitment of all of you and all the great questions. So, the debate doesn't end here. It, you can, you can always find me on LinkedIn, as many people know, and there's going to be more comments uh, coming. So well, with that, I will say thank you and close this session. And uh, Again, Colin, thank you for very much for, for hosting us and bringing this all together with all the team. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure, and thank you, everybody, for attending, making it such a great success. See you soon. See you soon. Thanks. I'll see you backstage.